After one hour and uh, I guess 29 minutes of deliberations in the case against Hannah Payne, the jury has reached a verdict. Uh, Payne, remember, is charged with murder after she followed 62-year-old Kenneth Herring from the scene of an accident and shot him during a confrontation. Was your verdict unanimous? Yes, ma'am. Has the verdict form been filled in, signed, and dated by you? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Foreperson, if you would go ahead and read the verdict. With regard to count one, as to the offense of malice murder, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty. With regard to count two, as to the offense of felony murder, we found, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty. 25 year old Hannah Payne was in tears as the jury's verdict was read out to the court. She stood accused of killing 62-year-old Kenneth Herring. She pleaded not guilty to all charges against her and remained steadfast in her testimony. Were those tears of joy? Was there a reasonable doubt that she killed Mr. Herring? Join us as we dive headfirst into the trial of Hannah Payne. 12th of December, 2023, the jury deliberated and returned with a verdict. But before we get to that, here is a brief refresher on how the crime went down. On the evening of May 7, 2019, the 285 area was shut down due to a battery truck fire accident. Since law enforcement needed to block the entrance and exits, it was notably a chaotic and traffic-filled day. In the midst of all of that, 62-year-old Kenneth Herring was involved in a minor car accident with another driver because he ran a red light in an area near Forest Parkway and Riverdale Road. Hannah Payne, who was 21 years old at the time, witnessed the incident and pulled over. She and another witness, a correctional officer named Terry Robinson, called 911 for assistance. Terry Robinson, who had experience working in a medical prison, took note of Mr. Herring's state of mind. He believed Mr. Herring was confused and disoriented after the accident. Additionally, he noticed some needles in Mr. Herring's vehicle, which also corroborated his beliefs that Mr. Herring was dealing with a medical issue as opposed to driving under the influence. Herring, Payne and Robinson all waited on the scene for approximately 20 minutes. When the police did not arrive, Herring got into his car and began to drive away. Before leaving, there were no conflicts or altercations. Mr. Herring did not say or do anything to provoke Hannah Payne, but surprisingly, she got in her car and drove after him. While driving, she called 911 again and explained that she was chasing Mr. Herring down. The 911 operator told her to stop, citing how it wasn't safe and that she did not have to do it. But Hannah Payne insisted and kept on driving. She drove aggressively through the streets and witnesses even claimed that she was cutting people off and almost hitting people on the road. Then at some point, she seized the opportunity to jump over a median and finally blocked Mr. Herring. And she did not stay in the car. She got out and charged towards Herring, screaming at him to get out of his truck. This was when the unthinkable happened. Mr. Herring rightfully tried to defend himself, but then there was a gunshot. Hannah Payne got back on the 911 call and claimed that she shot in self-defense, but witnesses and other forms of evidence would later prove that something more sinister happened. As a result, Hannah Payne was arrested and immediately charged with eight crimes. The charges against her included two counts of felony murder, one count of malice murder, one count of aggravated assault, one count of false imprisonment, and three counts of possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. Fast forward to December 2023, and the Hannah Payne trial finally began. Now 25, Hannah Payne pleaded not guilty to all charges brought up against her. She stuck to her initial testimony and continued to emphasize that she pulled out the gun in self-defense. What does this mean if Hannah Payne remains steadfast in her testimony? The trial began on the 6th of December 2023. Prosecutor Bonnie Smith delivered opening statements for the state. In her narration, she emphasized audacity as the reason behind Hannah Payne's actions as the aggressor in the moments leading up to the death of Kenneth Herring. On May the 7th, 2019, defendant Hannah Renee Payne had the audacity to chase, corner, detain, assault, shoot, and kill an unarmed 62-year-old Kenneth Herring who was sitting in his own car, all because 
She didn't like his driving. She didn't like how he acted. One by one, Bonnie Smith narrated the events of the day. From the heavy traffic to the 911 calls, the prosecutor left no stone unturned in painting the perfect picture of the crime. As it so happens, that just happened to be one of the worst traffic days in that area. 285 was shut down because a battery truck had caught on fire. So law enforcement is kind of blocking the entrance and exits for 285, and then there's another accident somewhere else in that area. So traffic is piled up, cars everywhere, no one can really get anywhere. The prosecution also emphasized that Mr. Herring was not in the most ideal state of mind. She established the fact that he did run a red light, which was wrong, but she also seemed to be confused and disoriented about what he had done. Mr. Herring appeared somewhat confused after the accident kept saying, who hit me, what's happening, things along those lines. And then started saying things like, I didn't do anything wrong, some confusion going on with Mr. Harry. And Mr. Robinson is going to tell you that not only is he a correctional officer, he's a correctional officer at a medical prison. And that he made some observations of Mr. Herring that led him to believe that it was a medical issue. He did not observe anything that made him believe that Mr. Herring had been drinking or that he was under the influence of anything. Just that he was having some sort of medical issue. And he- The prosecution emphasized that Hannah Payne was the primary aggressor in the conflict. Once that happens, you'll hear an escalation in what she's saying. Get the fuck out of the car! Get the fuck out of the car! I will shoot you! I will shoot you! And that's what the witnesses are. This is not something else. She's the aggressor. And anything Mr. Herring did would be to save, try to save his own life, even though he failed. To round up the opening statement, the prosecution revealed that these witnesses would take the stand to testify against Hannah Payne. She also hinted that there would be scientific evidence, 911 phone calls, and photographs of the scene that would equally serve as evidence against Hannah Payne. Following the prosecution's opening statement was the opening statement of the defense, which was delivered by Hannah Payne's attorney, Matthew Tucker, the defense began his statement with a plea to the jury that, irrespective of the public opinion and wide media coverage of the case, they should keep an open and fair mind with regard to the facts. He emphasized that sentiment should be thrown out the window when the evidence eventually speaks for itself during the course of the trial. He likened the case to that of a deceitful archer. He explained that the way such a deceitful archer would always paint the bullseye around the point his arrow lands is the same way the prosecution would try to nail the bullseye on Hannah Payne. So as we go through here and we see people try to paint a bullseye around an individual, the paint's not going to be there. That's not going to be enough evidence to make it look like a bullseye. It's not even going to be enough evidence to make it look like a target. So when you hear the evidence, and we anticipate the evidence to come out and talk about an accident, not a fender bender, an accident. This is a pretty bold claim on the part of the defense, and it just makes you wonder what kind of game-changing evidence they have up their sleeve. Then it starts to unfold. The defense establishes the role Terry Robinson played in the tragic events that followed the accident. First, he reminded the court that Robinson was a law authority and a correctional officer, so showing up and trying to take control of the scene was normal. Then he explained that the 911 call that the prosecution intended to use against Hannah Payne was not the slam dunk that they thought it was. According to the defense, the recorded call would prove that Kenneth Herring got reckless and began pacing around aggressively. He then explained that this behavior was what prompted Hannah to call 911 again. And to add to that, Robinson urged her to go after Herring, who was about to leave the scene. Hannah is on the phone with 911, telling them pretty much the same thing. Man, what, what? I don't know if this guy's leaving the scene. Get the tag number, get the tag number. And the correction officer, get the tag number, go, go, go. 
That's what you're going to hear a lot of You're not going to hear anything different. You're going to hear that. You're going to get to decide what was meant when he tells her, go, 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 get that tag. And she's on the phone with 911. And of course, 911 hearing goes, can you get the tag? He goes, yes, ma'am, I can. I can get the tag. In a calm voice. Not an excited voice, calm voice. Do we get it? And then there's kind of radio silence. Next, the defense made a very interesting argument with regards to why Hannah Payne continued her pursuit of Kenneth Herring. First, the attorney acknowledged that Hannah should have given up on the chase after she got his license tag. But then he argued that Hannah Payne, being young and Navi at the time, wanted to prevent Kenneth from causing more accidents. Unfortunately, this is not an argument that holds a lot of weight. Can anybody be convinced that Hannah actually believed Kenneth Herring to be dangerous and simply wanted to be a hero? But the defense did not stop there. He argued that the reason Hannah Payne blocked Kenneth Herring off was because she wanted to make him go back to the scene of the first accident. Hold at that time, it's just a phone. She just wants him to talk here. Talk to them. They want to talk to you. They want you to go back. They want me to go back. But that's not what she found out. And she found a very valuable lesson that a lot of people already know. Don't ever walk upon somebody in a car where they're trying to leave the scene of the accident or just leave. Don't know. The defense also stated that sometime during the course of this exchange, Kenneth Herring grabbed her and tried to pull her into the car. The defense also informed the court that Hannah Payne found some weapons in the car beside Kenneth Herring. Those weapons included a knife, a chain and a mini saw. The defense asserted that there are photographs to prove the presence of those weapons and that those photographs would prove that Hannah Payne was indeed defending herself and right to pull out a gun on Kenneth Herring. What you're gonna find. You don't know what's behind that wheel. You don't know what's in that car. Well, she didn't know what was in that car. There's a lot of things in that car. A lot of things that shouldn't be in that car. They're gonna show you pictures of a knife. They're gonna show you pictures of a chain or a small, uh, yes, a, a small saw. Work tools that can be used aggressively to cause substantial, serious, immediate harm. That, that. To defend Hannah pulling out the gun, the defense attorney also argued that Hannah was shocked that Kenneth pulled her into the car when all she was trying to do was get him to talk to the authorities or go back to the scene of the accident. The defense informed the court that there were scratches all over Hannah Payne's neck, there were also scratches on the back of her head and a couple of bruises on her face. He added that the photos of these bruises would be presented as evidence during the course of the trial. The defense also tried to drive home the possibility that Kenneth Herring did in fact pull the trigger. According to the defense, with the way Hannah was holding the gun, it is very likely that she could not have pulled the trigger. As she's being pulled from this side into the vehicle, as she's being pulled from this side, trying to get her gun, bam, there's another hand on it. And you will see pictures. You'll see a quick video that shows what happened. But when you slow it down and you look at the still shots, you're going to see what happens. And you're going to hear the forensic examiner, the forensic, for the gun prints come in and say, this gun, which is a nine millimeter, a Springfield, that's notorious for not having the shells jam. But yet in this case, that shell that spit shell is jammed in that gun. And as the state pointed out to you, there's male DNA all over the top of it. As this gun is being pulled back and pushed back at her. And as they're screaming and frantically pulling and pulling and bam, this gun goes off. He argued that the footage the prosecution intends to use against Hannah Payne could in fact prove her innocence. He explained that when the footage is slowed down, the still shots would tell a different story. The defense also argued that Hannah Payne's first instinct after the shooting was to call for help. The defense argued that she got back on the 911 call and was frantically calling for an ambulance afterwards. That phone is me. Oh my God. He just pulled the trigger on my gun and shot himself. We need an ambulance. We need the EMT out here. Please, we need the EMT. 
as witnesses walk around talking, asking questions. She's continuously saying, where's the ambulance? There's one right there, get an ambulance here. He just shot himself. She has no malice intent. She's never seen anything like that, 21 years old. But she knows somebody's hurting and they need an ambulance. And then you're gonna hear the forensics. And the forensics see, you'll have your own experience, your own knowledge. You'll get to make your decision based on what you see and what you know. I feel comfortable that when you see all this and you hear it all, there's no audacity. There's no somebody being malicious. It's a situation that somebody very young got put in following the direction of authority that by the grace of God she's alive to say today. And I don't want to take away... To conclude the first day of the trial, the 911 call from Terry Robinson, another bystander who saw the initial crash, was played before the jury. On day two of the trial, being the 7th of December 2023, the jurors heard Hannah Payne's 911 call, where the dispatcher repeatedly told her not to chase Kenneth Herring. Payne, number. No, but I'm packing up to him right now. Okay, but we actually do not want you to chase him. We just want to stay. Okay, I'm going to stay. Okay, I'm going to stay. 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 Not going to follow him um, because he is going to cause another accident. So I will stay behind him until the officers get to us. But until then, um, I'm not going to follow him. Eyewitnesses also testified to seeing the altercation and described Hannah Payne as the aggressor in the situation. You said it shortly after she jumped out of that jeep, she pulled her gun? Yeah. Yes. And went immediately to Mr. Herring's window? Yes. You never, did you ever see her attempt to de-escalate the situation? No. I don't recall her trying to de-escalate anything. And as you sit here today, you stated that Mr. Herring looked confused. Yes. This witness, Tayana McCranny, also recalled the utter lack of remorse displayed by Hannah Payne immediately after the shooting. Defendant after Mr. Herring was shot. Yes. And what was her demeanor at that time? Calm. Like, aloof. She just, when I saw her, she had the gun and the cops were coming and she just was up here, gave it to them. Like she, I don't know. There wasn't a lot of emotion in there. The trial continued on the 8th of December, 2023. The third day of the Hannah Payne trial began with testimony from a medical examiner who testified about Kenneth Herring's cause of death the medical examiner confirmed that Kenneth Herring was killed by a gunshot wound to the abdomen. Another eyewitness, Cameron Williams, took the stand as well and testified about seeing the confrontation between Hannah Payne and Kenneth Herring. I didn't know her name at the time, but what did you observe happening that drew that your attention? Um, I just seen her outside hitting on his window or his car door. Um, and that's what made me just pull out my phone. and describe what you see as far as where is um, Ms. Payne standing when you see her? Uh, well, her back is towards me, so I can't, I didn't see her face or anything, um, but she was actually standing at the guy's driver door. Okay. That's what I saw. And what did, it, what did you see her doing at that driver's door? Uh, yelling, hitting on the window, hitting on the door, whatever, the, you know, whatever she was doing. The jury also watched the cell phone video footage that Cameron Williams recorded of the incident. And is that the extent of the video that you had taken and recorded in this incident? Yes. 
He emphasized that he did not alter the video in any way and that he immediately handed it over to the authorities when they arrived. Chance to look at the recording that you were able to capture on your phone. Yes. Did you alter that recording or delete it or oh. add anything to it in any way? No, ma'am. So the video that you provided to law enforcement is what you recorded on your phone? Yes. Lastly, Cameron Williams recalled that he never saw any weapon or anything that could be used as a weapon in the hands of Kenneth Herring during the tussle. Anything in his hands that, would, uh, that you would have seen as a weapon? No. A couple of detectives also testified to their response and investigation while the jury saw body cam footage from the crime scene. Forward to Monday, the 11th of December, the Hannah Payne trial continued. Another witness, Ashley Jackson, gave her own testimony against Hannah Payne. She testified that she witnessed Hannah Payne at Herring's driver's side door, yelling obscenities and being very aggressive. I saw the defendant's vehicle cornering the other vehicle. What did you, if anything, did you see her do? Um, I saw her at the driver's side door of the vehicle uh, yelling obscenities for the man to get out the car. Um, it looks like she was trying to fight him through the window. And what was her demeanor at this time? Uh, very aggressive. Uh, very aggressive. After Ashley Jackson was cross-examined by the defense attorney, Hannah Payne was called to take the stand for the first time since her trial started. Hannah Payne boldly stood to testify in her own defense, and the jury got to hear her explain in her own words what happened the day that 62-year-old Kenneth Herring died. Hannah Payne stood accused of tracking down, shooting and killing 62-year-old Kenneth Herring after he left the scene of a car accident. Still, during her testimony, she explained that she was only trying to be a messenger for police when she approached Herring's truck with a 911 operator on the phone. Dispatch, what happened? And as he's pulling off, she's asking me, you know, was I able to get the tag number? Realizing I wasn't able to, I was already at my vehicle and I got in my, I completely got in my vehicle and went to go pull off. And at that time, the uh, truck driver and the state officer was still standing over in the street and he started waving me over, like calling me towards him. And when you got up close to him, what happened? Um, he, I asked him, did he go straight? And he said, yes. And he's telling me, he said, go. So at that time, you were under the impression that he's a state officer sending you to get the tag. And 911 knows that you're on the way to get the tag. Correct. And he was, when I was in my vehicle, when he was waving me over, his motions were, it was almost like he was waving me on. So when he brought me up, when I got up to him is when he told me to go. Okay. And he said go or did he say something? She acknowledged that the 911 dispatcher had told her not to do so, but she felt she had the situation under control. Payne said she was going to tell Herring he needed to return to the scene of the original accident. And I saw him stopped in the turning lane. So I turned as well and when I stopped I was under the impression with me having 911 on the phone that I could just be kind of like a messenger so I took my phone on speaker and I took it to him to show him that I had the police on the phone and I'm telling him they want us to go back to the original accident site. She could very well have driven back to the scene as she was instructed, but she stubbornly decided to challenge Herring head on. At this point, Hannah Payne then emphasized that Kenneth Herring had twisted her wrists and neck and pulled her into his truck. I wasn't thinking that I needed adequate space to stay away from him or anybody or anything. And then you said he knocked the phone out of your hand. Yes. And then he grabbed you. You said one was on your wrist. And where was the other hand? Um, and originally he had just grabbed my wrist. And he had pulled me in the car. And um, at some point my shirt had gotten grabbed. Okay. Um, and he... Go ahead. He 
was pulling my wrist and he pulled me in the vehicle and he kept yelling at me telling me I have something for you um, and he used I have some pardon but I have something for you bitch and he's leaning and he's reaching and he's pulling and at this point I remember that I'm, I'm sorry take your time I remember that he had let go of my wrist and he grabbed me by the back of my neck and it was as if he was trying to kind of keep a hold of me um, the entire time sure she was wearing the day of incident. Was it torn when you were wearing it that day? No. When uh, Mr. Heron grabbed you, did he tear it? Yes. And is this a fair representation of the ribs and what it ended up being at the end? Yes. Along with the ribs in that shirt, was there any other part of your body that had any kind of marks from where he grabbed you? Uh, yes. Okay, where were those? I had marks on the back of my neck and kind of scratches along my arms, bruisings um, on my wrist, and scratches along my chest. Okay. Anything in the facial area? Yes. Um, I had a kind of a black eye, but a bruised eye and a busted um, upper lip. And other, I guess, like sore spots, like are bruising and redness around the edges of my face. And all of this occurred while he was dragging you uh, forward towards your vehicle? Correct. Okay. And she also testified that he also began to reach for something in his vehicle, but she couldn't see what it was. Then she said he hit the gas and his truck rolled forward. In her own words, when you are being held against your will and have no idea what's ahead of you and you're looking down, it just feels like it lasts forever. And I just remember I saw my life flash before my eyes and I thought I was going down Riverdale Road, hanging out the side of his car. Hannah Payne went on to testify that this was what prompted her to reach for her weapon. As she put it, she feared for her life. The two struggled over the weapon for a brief moment and Hannah Payne maintained her claim that it was Kenneth Herring who pulled the trigger. Payne told the jury that she never had her finger on the trigger of the gun and that Herring had attacked her and tried to pull her into his vehicle. It was standing there were basically again asking what had happened. Did you, and she, she asked me, she said, did you just shoot him? And I told her, I said, no. I said, he, he pulled me into the vehicle. He had a hold of me but that I never had my finger on the trigger. Of course, during the cross-examination, the prosecutors argued that all of this could have been avoided if Hannah Payne had not followed Kenneth Herring or introduced a gun to the situation. The fifth and final day of the Hannah Payne trial was on the 12th of December, 2023. As expected, both the prosecution and the defense delivered closing arguments for the case. The prosecution opened the statement with a quote from defendant Hannah Payne. If until I was 18 and my grandfather passed away, I was going to be a police officer. And on May 7, 2019, she got her opportunity. And as a result, 62-year-old Kenneth Herring, who was unarmed and minding his own business, was chased down detained, shot, and murdered by this defendant. The prosecution emphasized again that Hannah Payne was acting from a place of extreme entitlement, which was fueled by audacity that hunted down Kenneth Herring and made him obey her. The prosecution urged the jury to be fair and impartial and to seek the truth without doubt. And the purpose of the jury trial system is to seek the truth, not to seek doubt is to seek the truth. The defense reminded the jury that Hannah Payne took the stand and blamed everyone but herself for the death of Kenneth Herring. When you watch the defendant's interview, 
she never mentions to the detectives at any point in time that she yelled at him, that she screamed at him, and that she demanded that he get out of the vehicle. Her characterization was, I walked up to the car, I held the phone, and I said, I have 911 on the phone, and they want you to go back to the scene. And that all of a sudden, you know, the victim just became very irate, grabbing her and pulling her into the car. And that's not what any of the witnesses saw. She reminded the jury that all the witnesses who took the stand to provide direct evidence in the case could not all be lying against Hannah Payne. She emphasized that they all saw one thing, and that was the fact that Hannah Payne was the primary aggressor in the conflict, who at no point tried to de-escalate the situation. ...and what they saw, and what was consistent between Ms. McCraney, Ms. Rosser, Ms. Jackson, and Mr. Williams, was that there was only one aggressor on May 7, 2019. And that was the defendant. Then, the prosecution reminded the jury that Hannah Payne was not actually entitled to a self-defense benefit because she was the initial aggressor. She explained that whatever Mr. Herring did or did not do to Hannah Payne was grossly irrelevant because he was the only one in the right to actually defend himself from the aggressor. Oh, a bear. And then when the bear turns around and attack you, want to claim self-defense. It doesn't work that way. The defense attorney also delivered his closing statement. And right off the bat, he disregarded everything the prosecution said as not a piece of reliable evidence. Everything the state says is not evidence. So you to disregard it, the defense went on to pick apart the testimonies from eyewitnesses as well as the forensic evidence. For one, he established the fact that Hannah Payne handed the gun over to an officer who was not wearing any gloves and presented this as a reason why there were multiple fingerprints on the gun. Took the gun off, handed it to Officer Ritchie, who had no gloves. He was hanging on that gun for a while, he had to, until he could go put it in evidence. So there's your other. In his own words, the prosecution did not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Hannah Payne pulled the trigger that killed Kenneth Herring. The jury deliberated for only about two hours before returning a verdict. Go ahead and read the verdict. With regard to count one, as to the defense of malice murder, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty. With regard to count two, as to the offense of felony murder, we found, we the jury find the defendant guilty. With regard to count three, as to the offense of aggravated assault, we the jury find the defendant guilty. With regard to count four, as the offense of felony murder, we find the, we the jury find the defendant guilty. With regard to count five, as the offense of false imprisonment, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty. With regard to count six, as to the offense of possession of firearm during commission of a felony, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty. With regard to count seven, as to the offense of possession of firearm during commission of a felony, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty. With regard to count eight, as to the offense of possession of firearm during commission of a felony, we, the jury, find the defendant guilty. Respectfully submitted the 12th day of December, 2023. On the 15th of December, 2023, Hannah Payne tearfully received a life sentence for the murder of Kenneth Herring. To count one, malice murder, the court will impose a sentence of life with the possibility of parole. With respect to count two, felony murder, that will merge into count one and is dismissed. With respect to count three, aggravated assault, that merges into counts one and two. 
with respect to count four, felony murder, that merges into count one and it is dismissed as a matter of law. With respect to count five, the false imprisonment uh, verdict, the court imposes a sentence of eight years consecutive. With respect to count six, possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony, the court imposes a sentence of five years that will run consecutive uh, to the underlying sentence. Count seven and eight will merge into count six. So the court's total sentence is life with the possibility of par parole plus eight years consecutive on the false imprisonment and five years consecutive on the possession of firearm during the commission of a felony. And that is the court sentence.